I am continuing my summary of chapters from matter and interactions. Uh, this is chapter 14, Electric Fields of Matter. And so just a reminder, I'm going over just the very basic ideas in the chapter. I'm not really solving any problems. Um, you know, this should not replace you reading the book. The book is pretty good. So in chapter 13, we talked about the electric field due to point charges and dipoles. And so in this chapter, we're talking about the electric fields and, and matter. And the first thing that they want to talk about, the first thing in here is the idea of conservation of charge. I'm going to write it out. Conservation of charge. This chapter is very conceptual. There's not a lot of uh, problems in here, but it's important to deal with for stuff later because you know the name of the book book the textbook is matter and interaction So this is the matter part the matter part of matter and interactions At the fundamental level we can't just create charge You know you can think of three really common charges that we're going to see or objects that we're going to see the proton uh, It has a charge of plus e where e is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. You don't need to know that. I'm just telling you that. We have the electron. It's minus E. That's an E. And then I, I do want to point out that we have the neutron, right? And it has, it has a net charge of zero. And I like these three. These are not all the particles that we're going to see. But, you know, pretty much everything that you look at around you is made up of these three things. And that's kind of crazy, right? Um, so... Let's look at some other particles because just to show how this conservation of charge works, we have an electron. We also have another object that's really useful, a positron. And you notice all the names are on, right? And a positron also has a charge of plus E. It's the same mass as the electron, but it has a positive charge. So the proton has a positive charge equal and opposite the electron, but they're completely different things, right? A proton is a proton is a technically a hadron, and an electron is a fundamental particle. So they're these are not the same. But these these two are the same. And in fact, if you put a proton, I mean a positron, which is a po an antimatter, this is an antimatter electron, and an electron and they are near each other, like that. They had tracked, there's an attractive force, right, because they're opposite charges, and there's nothing to prevent them from coming into each other, and they turn into light. And that's called annihilation. And I'm talking about annihilation because in this process, charge is conserved, right? The charge before the interaction is plus E minus E, which is zero, and then afterwards, there's nothing there and the charge is zero. So charge is conserved. Um, the same thing is true. You can actually do what's something called pair production. You can have light and it produces uh, a positron and an electron. But again, no charge before, no charge after. So charge is conserved. Okay, so we can't just make charge. I don't know why, that's just the way it is. Next thing, let's talk about um, the interaction between uh, a charge and neutral matter. So suppose I take a little uh, a, a pen. And they talk about uh, how you can charge things. Let's say suppose this has uh, a positive excess charge on it. It's an insulator. It's a plastic pen. Um, the first thing that we should say is that the, the neutral pen has, I'm talking about a, a pen like this, right? It has uh, an equal number of protons and electrons. In order for this to be positive, it has to have more protons than electrons. How do you do that? Well, you do that by taking away the electrons. You can't add protons because where would I get those protons from? Suppose I have some other material that I rub it with. Well, the protons are in the nucleus of the atom and you really can't take them out. If you do, you're changing that atom, but you can take out the electrons. So I can take out the electrons of this and leave it positive, okay. Now, if I take this near, this is a really cool experiment to do. I, I can't do it today because it's super dry. But if I take a little piece of paper like that, the paper is neutral, but it's still attracted to this. It's attracted because this paper becomes polarized. And in that case, um, if it's, let's, let's actually say it's a piece of aluminum foil. The, 
negative charges get pulled to one side, the positives left at least positives on the other side. And so now we have a, a, something that looks like a dipole. So the, the negatives are closer to the positives, so there's a greater attractive force than the repulsive force from this. So charge objects attract neutral matter. Let's look at um, an atom. Suppose I have just, let's say it's a hydrogen atom. So I have a positive uh, charge, a proton, and then the electron doesn't have a point, right? We In quantum mechanics, we deal with uh, the probability density of the electron. So it actually is as though the electron is evenly spread out over there. That's what it looks like. I know that's weird. Quantum mechanics is weird. We just have to deal with it. And so in this case, uh, these two charges look like they're exactly on top of each other. There would be no electric field outside of there. However, what if I put another proton right there? Well, this is going to create an electric field that repels that proton. And so this proton, this becomes now this. So my electron cloud gets shifted. And this looks like I have uh, a dipole because the electron and the proton have the equal charges and we can approximate this as two charges separated by some distance s. We can describe, if you recall, we have this charge q minus q and this term qs comes up in our electric field to the dipole. If you recall, the dipole on the axis, I'll call that dA, the magnitude was 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught 2 qs over r cubed. And we said that this, I think I said this, we can call this qs term the dipole moment. And in fact, we're going to call it a vector in the direction from, is it from q to s or s to q? I can't remember, but we'll call that dipole moment p, uh, the magnitude of it is equal to qs. Because that qs shows up in the other term too. So it's a good way to describe uh, the field around a dipole. Well, it turns out that this dipole moment depends on the applied electric field. So the magnitude p is some constant alpha times the applied electric field, where alpha is the, polar, the polarizability. I guess I should write that. Polarize ability. So it depends. The the higher that value, the, the when you apply electric field, these are going to separate more and make another electric field. So let's just let's just look at what would happen if I put a charge near an, an induced dipole and calculate the force just for fun. Okay, and I don't normally do calculations, but this this chapter is a little weak on calculations, so I thought I'd do it. So let's say I have my induced dipole right there, and I have my charge here. I'll call that Q1, and this is Q, and that's minus Q. So the first thing is, why is there a dipole here? And th these are separated by distance r. There's a dipole here because this makes an electric field, and we'll call that E1 that way. Let's calculate the magnitude of that. This is just a simple point charge. I can calculate the magnitude of E1. E1 is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught Q1 over r squared. That's just the magnitude of the electric field due to a dipole. I mean, to a point charge. Now, I can use that to calculate the dipole moment over here, QS. So QS is going to be equal to alpha times E1, right? That's going to tell me how much this is uh, polarized based on that charge. And then I can calculate the electric field due to this induced dipole over here. I'll call that ED for the dipole, electric field due to the dipole. ED it's going to be equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. Oh, it's this way. ED. That's, I'm just doing the magnitude. 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught to QS over R cubed. I've, I've derived that in another video. It's in the previous chapter. But QS is alpha E1. So this is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught uh, to alpha E1 over r cubed. And then I can put in this expression for E1. I get uh, ED, the dipole, the electric field due to the dipole right here is going to be equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. Uh, and then I have E1, it has another 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. And then I have 2 alpha. 
and then I have Q1, and then I have Q. Is that right? Q1, Q. No, the Q is in the alpha. No, the Q the Q's are already taken into account. So I just have the Q1. Yeah, 2QS is alpha E1. And then I have, uh, this has a 1 over R squared. There is a 1 over R cubed. So I get uh, R to the fifth. And that's the electric field. If I multiply it by that charge right there, then I get this. And that's the electric, the, that's the force. I did this poorly. Okay. But it is 1 over R to the fifth, and you see that it is an attractive force, even though that's a neutral object. Okay. Let's move on to um, drift speed and metals. So if I have a, we have two things. We have insulators and conductors. So this is an insulator. This, not the string. This metal, it's got my name on it, so you know it's my scissors, is a conductor. So in an insulator, we have uh, positive and negative charges, and the negative charges can move a little bit to polarize things, but if I apply an electric field to an insulator, what's going to happen is it will polarize, right? But it's going to polarize in the direction of this at the atomic level or the molecular level. So we'll get a bunch of little bitty dipoles in there. This is an insulator. If I have a conductor, the difference with the conductor is that now the outer available electrons are free to move. In like a, it's, we call it an electron C. If I apply an electric field, these electrons are going to move and appear over here on the surface. All of them are going to shift, and that's going to leave excess charges over here that are positive. Again, this is a neutral object, neutral object, but they have a different way of polarization. And in this case, imagine I have an extra electron in here and I apply electric field. Well, the electric field inside here doesn't get canceled, okay? Remember, we have superposition. However, if I have the external electric field plus electric field due to these charges, if it's not zero here, this charge is gonna move. And so these charges are gonna move over to the wall until E inside, inside is equal to zero, I guess zero vector. And that's not true here in the insulator, but in a conductor in static equilibrium, that's true. We're going to look at later when we do have an electric field in a conductor that's not zero. And in fact, if we have a non-zero electric field inside of a conductor, the, the charges do move. Uh, you would imagine that they would increase in speed, and they do a little bit. They start like this. Uh, here, if we plot velocity as a function of time, if you apply a force due to an electric field, it's going to accelerate, and then it's going to collide with other atoms in there and stop, accelerate, stop, accelerate, stop, accelerate, stop, accelerate, stop, and this gives us some average velocity, V. We call that the drift velocity, and it's equal to U times E. U is the electron mobility. And then E is the applied field. This is going to be really important later when we talk about electric circuits. So if I increase the field, yes, these, these accelerate greater, but we get a greater average velocity. And that's what we call drift velocity. Okay. Like I said, there's a lot of things in here just about, there's things in there about charging and discharging and, and stuff like that. But I, I, th I don't really have much to add other than what's in the book. Um, I think that's good enough as a summary for chapter 14. Don't worry, chapter 15 is going to get way better. A lot more calculations. It's going to be a lot of fun. That's the end.